Mark chapter 12. Then he, Jesus, began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a place for the wine vat and built a tower, and he leased it to vine dressers and went into a far country. Now at vintage time, he sent a servant to the vine dressers that he might receive some of the fruit that the vineyard from the, from the vine dressers. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Again, he sent them another servant, and at him they threw stones, wounded him in the head, and sent him away shamefully treated. And again, he sent another and him they killed, and many others, beating some and killing some. Therefore still, having one son, his beloved, he also sent him to them, last, saying, well, they will respect my son. But those vine dressers said among themselves, this is the heir, come, let us kill him and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him and cast him out of the vineyard. Therefore, what will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the vine dressers and give the vineyard to others. Have you not even read this scripture? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Father, we thank you. And we just declare to you, Lord Jesus, that you are our cornerstone. You are the one that, Lord, that we build our life upon from whom every other stone in our life, Lord, is placed. Only by you are we guided. Only by you, Lord, will our, our life have purpose, have meaning, have power. You are stronger, greater, mightier than anything out there, Lord. And, Lord, we're looking to you this morning to come into this place, Lord, and baptize us with the Holy Spirit. Move among us. Open our eyes. Open our ears. Loose our tongues. Give understanding to our mind. We didn't come here, Lord, to stay the same. We came here, Lord, so that we would leave here changed. Would you do it, Lord? Would you show your hand mighty and strong today? Would you move among us with power? I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, you may be seated. So Jesus here is just a few days from being crucified. The day before, he had gone into the temple where they were selling sheep and doves for Passover sacrifices and changing money. And he overturned the tables of the sellers and drove them out of the temple. 
That's what had happened the day before the place we are here in Mark chapter 12. The following morning, the morning after he had gone into the temple and overturned all those tables and seats and drove the people out, he came back and he was met by the chief priests, the religious scribes, and other leaders of the people. And they asked him, by what authority did you do what you just did? Who gave you that authority just to come in here and be overturning tables? Who gave you that authority? You can read it. Back in verse 28. They said to him, by what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority? I'm reading from chapter 11, verse 28 there. And he answered them in verse 29. He said, I will ask you a question. Answer my question and I'll answer you. By what authority did John the Baptist get his ministry? In verse 31, the religious leaders, they huddled up and said to each other, well, we can't say John the Baptist because we can't say he got his authority from heaven, rather, because he will ask us why we didn't believe in him and be baptized ourselves. We can't say he had no authority because the people loved John the Baptist so much. We can't offend them. And so in verse 33 of chapter 11, they went back to Jesus and said, well, we don't know. We don't know where John the Baptist got his authority. And then again, where we started this morning, chapter 12, verse 1 says, then he began to speak to them in parables. We know from the book of Luke, in the parallel account, it says that he began to speak to the people. So he, spoke, he was speaking to the people in the temple, but the religious leaders are still there. And we'll see that because in, in, in verse, actually, where is it? Uh, in verse 12, it, it describes what the response of the leaders wa- were to him talking to the people. So, let's read what Jesus said to the people in the hearing of the religious leaders who had just asked them, who gave you this authority to go in and knock over tables and drive people out of the temple? He actually answers the question here in chapter 12. Again, let's read it. He said, A man planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it. He dug a place for the wine vat and built a tower and he leased it to vine dressers and went into a far country. Now at vintage time, meaning the time to produce the wine, He sent a servant to the vine dressers that he might receive some of the fruit, the vineyard from the vine dressers. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Again, he sent them another servant, and at at him they threw stones, wounded him in the head, sent sent him away shamefully. In verse 5, and again he sent another, and and him they killed, and many others beating some uh, uh, and killing others. Therefore, Still having a son, his beloved, he also sent him to them last, saying, they will respect my son. Those vine dressers said among themselves, this is the heir, come let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him and cast him out of the vineyard. So a parable. A parable is a story which illustrates truth. The parable itself never happened. But it represents things that actually did happen. 
The characters each represent someone. So for example, in verse 1, it says, A man planted a vineyard. Question time. I'm going to have a bunch of questions this morning. You guys ready? A man planted a vineyard. Who's the man? What? God the God the Father. The man is God the Father. He owns the vineyard. Who's the vineyard? Israel. Correct. The vineyard is the nation of Israel. We know that from Isaiah 5, by the way. You can go there. Jesus is speaking in such a way that the religious leaders will know exactly what he's talking about. They know Isaiah 5. Verse 1 continues, He set a hedge around it, dug a place for the wine vat, and built a tower. He leased it to vine dressers and went to a far country. Who are the vine dressers? Nope. Who are the vine dressers? I haven't heard it. Uh, uh. The people. That's right. The children of Israel. The vine dressers are the children of Israel. So the vineyard is... The, the nation of Israel, or you could say, that, rather, um, it's the land of Israel, the vine dressers of the people who live in it. Verse 2, again, says, Now at vintage time, that's the time to bring in the fruit or to produce the wine, he sent um, a servant to the vine dressers. Now, who's the servant? I heard this already. Who, who is it? That's right. It's the prophets. It's the prophets of God. He sent a servant to the vine dressers that he might receive some of the fruit, the vineyard from the vine dressers. Okay. Let's, let's get hard. Those were the simple ones. What's the fruit? What's the fruit he's asking for? Now, keep in mind, we've been talking about fruit the last few weeks, right? But it's a fruit of a believer in Christ in the, pre in the previous chapter. So a fruit of a believer of, in Christ is what? The life of God in you being reproduced in the life of others. These guys are killing people. They're killing the Messiah. They're not believers. So what's the fruit? Josh, what's the fruit? What? I can't believe it. It's in my notes. Worship. You got it. Worship. It's, it's the worship of God. It's the love of God. It's the obedience of God. They, he, he, he sent this. This is a parable. He sent his, uh, a servant. He sent a prophet. He sent the prophets to Israel to get worship, to call people back to worship, to call people back to obedience, to love him. To love him, to love him, because that's what worship is. It's loving God. All right. So verse 3 continues. They, um, um, they took him, meaning the servant, the prophet, beat him, and sent him away empty-handed. Again, he sent them another servant, meaning another prophet. And at him, they threw stones, wounded him in the head, sent him away shamelessly treated. And again, he sent another. They killed him. Uh, and, and, and him they killed, and many others, beating some and killing some. Therefore, verse 6, still having one son, his beloved. Who is the son? Everybody at once. Who is the son? Jesus. Therefore, have, still having one son, the beloved, he also sent him to them last, saying, well, they'll respect my son. Let's continue. This quiz hasn't ended. This test. You guys are doing good. But those vine dressers said among themselves, this is the heir. 
I mean, this is the one who inherits the vineyard. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. Verse 8, so they took him and killed him and cast him out of the vineyard. Therefore, what will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the vine dressers and give the vineyard to others. Who are the others? The Gentiles, the non Jews. There's Jews, less than 1% of the world at the time then and today, and then there's the 99% of others, us, or there may be a, a, some Jewish folks in the room, but it's basically, it's everybody else, the non-Jews. So let's go over that. All right, this is it. The vineyard owner, God the Father, the far country, oh, oh, I didn't, I didn't say who the far country was. So, so he went to a far country. This is the God the Father. He reigns in heaven. Um, and, and that is in uh, uh, verse, verse 1 there, the second part. He leased it to the vine dressers and went to a far country. Um, the vineyard is Israel. It's actually the land of Israel. Uh, the vineyard workers, the children of Israel, the vineyard owner servants, the prophets of Israel, fruit is worship, love, and obedience. Vineyard owner's son, Jesus, others, non-Jews. So there you have it. This is the parable, and this is the interpretation. Now, this parable is what happened in the past in Jewish history. It's the, it, it's, it's, it's the parable of what happened in Jewish history, but it was also prophetic in that it was speaking of what was going to happen within three or four days. So on Tuesday nights at 2566 Washington Street, about a mile away from here, I teach through the Old Testament, and we have seen this whole parable play out. God the Father delivers the children of Israel from slavery in Egypt, and he brings them into the land of Israel. And, and right before he brings the, the children of Israel into Israel, their land of Israel, he, through Moses, says this to them. He says this to them in Deuteronomy. So, he, again, he delivered them from slavery in Egypt. They're 40 years in the wilderness. They go right up to the border of where they're going to pass in, right on the other side, the east side of the Jordan, where they're going to pass in. And this is what God tells them at that time, the Israelites, through Moses. Verse 7, Deuteronomy 8, the Lord God is bringing you into a good land a land of brooks, of water, of fountains and springs that flow out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of, of vines and fig trees, of pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey, a land in which you will eat bread without scarcity, in which you will lack nothing, a land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you can dig copper. But when you have eaten, so when you get there and you've eaten and you are full, beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments, his judgments, his statutes, which I command you to do, lest when you have eaten and are full and have built beautiful houses and dwell in them, and when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and gold are multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, that your heart is lifted up and you forget the Lord your God, the God who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of slavery. And then they went in. They went in. And they settled, and God multiplied the wheat, the, the barley, the pomegranates, the, the, the honey, the, 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 the copper, the gold, the silver. 
And they ate. They got full. They forgot God. They forgot him. And then God sends prophet. And again, on Tuesday nights, we've been going through this whole thing. God sends prophet after prophet after prophet after prophet after prophet. They're beaten. They're killed. Ahab and Jezebel kill many of, of the prophets, actually hundreds. The prophet Micah beaten, thrown in prison. The prophet Zechariah killed. Jeremiah beaten, thrown into a well. And it was made to live there. A pr- they, basically, they use it as a prison. They would put his food, they would put it down the well. Another prophet prophesying um, at the time of, uh, of Jeremiah is killed. It's really happened. And what did God do? God did, verse 2. At vintage time, he sent a servant, a prophet, to them that he might receive some of the fruit, worship, obedience, turn them back to the Lord. They took him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Verse 4, he sent another, he sent another prophet. They took him and beat him and sent him away. Verse 5, he sent another, and and him they killed. And many others, beating some and killing others. Parables are fictitious stories that never happened. This would never happen, this story, in reality. What landowner... If they sent an employee to get rent, there's a few of you who are land, uh, landlords in here. You know this? What, how many among you landlords are, uh, uh, or, or landlords, you send someone to get rent, uh, they, they get beaten up and sent back, are going to leave? Those renters in your place, who, who among you here would do that? What landlord is going to, what landowner would let the tenants stay there? No such thing. But God let them stay. God let them stay. And instead of kicking them out, he sent another prophet. Same thing happened. Another one. Same thing happened. Beaten, killed. Another, another, another. And another, 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 another. And this is why I plead every time I get the chance. Read your Old Testament. Because if you don't, you will have a shallow understanding of the grace and love of God. I've never met a Christian who had a full, mature understanding of the grace and love of God who was unschooled in the Old Testament. The exceeding, abundant grace and love of God. How God suffers long with his people. 1 Corinthians 13, 4. Paul lays out the definition of love. The very first part of the definition is what? Love suffers long. What does it mean that God's suffering Love suffers long. It means as God's children disobey, as you disobey, as you rebel against them, it causes great suffering and pain, but he continues to suffer and love. He suffers a long time. He's suffering a long time. And why is he suffering? Why is he suffering? What does the verse say? The verse says in verse 2, it says at vintage time he sent a prophet that he might receive some of the fruit. What's fruit? It's love. It's love. He's suffering because he's not getting love. A parent whose children grow older and they get out of the house and they rebel, and they're disobedient, and the parent goes to them, and, and, and they're rejected. No, what are they looking for that when they go to their, their child, their rebellious child? They're looking for love. This is what they're looking for. And to be pushed away. But 
But then to go back and to go back and to go back, always looking for the same thing, love. What was God looking for when he sent those? He was looking for love. Love suffers long. And it, he suffered, he suffered, he suffers until he gets it. That's how God loves you. The Bible says that in the book, book of Romans, chapter 11, as a believer in Jesus Christ, you've been grafted into the tree of, of, of Israel. That means, uh, the, the, that, that means when a tree is cut off at the stump, you can actually stick a twig of another tree into that tree, and it can grow up. You, as a non-Jew, have been grafted into Israel. And as a result... You now have the privileges once held only by the children of Israel. Again, look at verse 9. Therefore, what will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the vineyard, the vine dressers, and give the vineyard to others. And that means you. This is God's love for you, Calvary Chapel. Suffers long. He suffers long. He will go back and back and back. He goes to you, push him away. Go to him, you push him away. Go to him, you push away. Some of you have been pushing him away. Why you came to a church this morning, I don't know. You've been pushing God away. This is not the place to come where you're pushing God. But so, a couple of you, that's, who, that's what you've been doing. You've been pushing away God. In the book of Hosea, in the Old Testament, after what is described in this period had gone on for hundreds of years, the prophet Hosea, again, for hundreds of years, Hosea shows up, but after hundreds of years of prophets going to it, being sent from heaven, every prophet is sent to, every man, woman of God is sent from heaven out to gather his people. And Hosea shows up, prophet after prophet after prophet had come in, beaten, killed, beaten, killed, beaten, killed. And this is what God says to Israel in the book of Hosea. Chapter 11, verse 8. Oh, how can I give you up, Israel? How can I let you go? How can I forsake you? Who talks like this after being rejected for hundreds of years? Not you, not me, not man, not woman, but God does. How can I give you up my Israel? How can I let you go? How can I forsake you? My heart cries out within me. The New King James says, my heart churns within me. How I long to help you. How I long to help you. They refuse to be helped. No, I will not punish you, even though my fierce anger tells me to. The Bible speaks of this concept. Um, John chapter 3, is it 36? Um, where it talks about the wrath of God sort of abides over an un... But the wrath, the anger of God abides over an unbelieving person or an unbelieving city. But the love of God restrains him from executing the wrath for a season. The Bible says the wrath will come eventually. But who loves like this? Who loves like this after being rejected time after time, after sending from heaven men and women of God to turn Israel back? And, the, and, and, and who loves like this? How can I give you up, my Israel? How can I let you go? How can I forsake you? My heart cries out within me. How I long to help you. And I will not punish you even though my fierce anger tells me to. Hosea chapter 11, verse 8. The why. Why, is, why does God love like this? Why does God love like this? That's another good question. Why does God love like this? Josh, you can't answer. Why does God love like this? Who said that? 
because he is love. God can't help but be who he is. God is love. 1 John 4, 8, and then because we don't, we have a hard time understanding what we read, he says it again eight verses later. In verse 16, God is love. He operates by love. But why does he wait? Why does he wait? Why does he wait? Why does love suffer long? What's he waiting for? What did God want from Israel more than anything else? Again, verse 2, that fruit, that love, that love, that's what he wants. He wants the love. He wants to be loved back. Calvary Chapel, he wants you to love him back. Go down to verse 28 of this same chapter. No, yes, verse 28 of this same chapter. Go down to uh, verse 28. Then one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him. So this is one of the religious scribes. He asked Jesus at the end of verse 28, which is the first commandment of all? What's the greatest commandment? Jesus answered. The first of, of all is the commandment is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. This is how God wants to, you to love him, Calvary Chapel. This is how God wants you to love him. Not anemic love. Not weak love. Not, not lip service. He wants you, Calvary Chapel, to, verse 30, to love him with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, and he keeps on coming back and back and back and back until he gets it. He wants it that bad, and he, he loves you that much. So what does God ultimately do? He sends servant, sends a servant, beaten. He sends another servant, beaten. He sends another servant, beaten. And then others, beaten and killed, beaten and killed. What does he do finally? Well, like Sodom and Gomorrah, he sent fire out of the sky and he destroyed the land of Israel. No, he does not do that. He sends his own son. Let's read verse 6 together. Verse 6 of Mark chapter 12. Therefore... Still having one son, his beloved, he also sent him to them, last, saying, they will respect my son. He sent his son. God sent his own son. When is that going to register with us, Calvary Chapel? He sent his son who loves like this. No one loves like this. And the, the thing about this parable is, is that it would never, never, never happen with anyone other than God. This is what the parable teaches, Calvary Chapel. Stop trying to find a man as a substitute for God. I, th I, I, this is... I don't know what percentage of, of this is my pastoral ministry. Some large percentage. Women thinking that men is going to resolve all their problems. And when women pursue men and get their man to resolve their problem, it just makes their life worse. Or men thinking that a woman is going to solve his problems. Ain't going to happen. It's going to get worse, guys. Don't pursue women for that reason. Women, don't pursue men for that reason. There is no substitute for God. There's no one who loves like this. And, 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 and what does God want back? He wants your love. He, wives... You're not supposed to love your husbands like you're supposed to love God. You're supposed to love your husbands infinitely more than God. 
Men, you're supposed to love your wives infinitely more than you love rather. No, I wasn't paid to say that. I was not paid to say that. Okay, I want my $500 after the service. <laughs> Men, husbands, you are to love God infinitely more than you love your wives. Believe me, your marriages will be like, have the opportunity to be like heaven when you love God that way. A God that loves like this. Again, therefore, still having one son, his beloved, he also sent him to them last, saying, they will respect my son, his beloved son. Do you remember at the very beginning of the book of Mark, Jesus is baptized? I, I was just so rocked this time around when I read this in Mark chapter 1. Do we have that, Dave? In Mark chapter 1, Jesus is being baptized, and it says that as he's coming out of the water, verse 10 and 11, he saw the heavens parting. I mean, this is like the coolest thing in the world. <laughs> he's coming out of the water. He's seeing the heavens parted, the Spirit descending upon him like a dove, and then a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Now, at the, at the time when we were in these verses, um, we really went deep into the, uh, into the Greek. What it, what it really is saying, you are my much-loved son. You give me so much joy. And that's who God sent to die for you. That's who he sent to die for you. The parable continues in verse 7. Let's read it. But those vine dressers said amongst themselves, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him. And the inheritance will be ours. Verse 8, so they took him and killed him and cast him out of the vineyard. Therefore, what will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the vine dressers and give the vineyard to others. Have you not even read this scripture? They had but they just wanted to ignore it. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. The stone is Jesus. It's a great little Bible study. If you want to go through every, t every reference of Jesus as being the stone, the book of Daniel, the book of Isaiah, the book of Jeremiah. Verse 11, this was the Lord's doing. And it is marvelous in our eyes. So again, it says here, Therefore, what will the owners of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the vineyard and give the vineyard to others. The book of Matthew in the parallel account helps us out in this way. It says, He will lease the vineyard to others who will give him his share of the fruits. Who will give him his share of the fruits. That's you. You're the others, and you are to love God. Calvary Chapel, love God. Love Jesus Christ. Go love your God today. Love your God right now. This is, what, this is why you were given the vineyard, to love God, to love him with all your heart, your mind, and your soul, to love him, to love Jesus Christ Again, um, verse 2 three through 5, it says that he, he sent a servant, beaten and killed. He sent a servant, beaten, 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 beaten. Why? He wanted love. He wants your love. He wants your love. That is why he came to you so many times uh, before you entered into a relationship with him. And then e even since then, even after giving your life to God, to Jesus Christ, he keeps on doing it. He keeps on going back. See, so keeps on sending people your way or some dude on the internet or, or, or just by the Holy Spirit or some circumstance. He keeps on going back to you. What does he want? That fruit of the vineyard, your love. Loving him passionately, not in a shallow way. On uh, Friday night at the prayer workshop, um, we talked about the fact that in Psalm 50, Rather, uh, in the Psalms, it says that David or the other psalmist cried out, 
It uses the term cry out. It used that term 51 times. 51 times. David cries out, Oh God, I cry out to you. Where are you, God? Come to me. That's how God wants to be loved. By you. The vineyard was given to you and taken away from someone else. He didn't get the love for them. He, he, he wants the love from you. Now, Israel, by the way, there is a plan in the, in the latter days, and it's already started with Israel being regathered, um, where, where he's, he's, he's given them another chance to come back to him. That's how much he loves them. But you have been given the vineyard, Calvary Chapel, to love Jesus Christ. What does someone who love, loves God do? I love... First, I mean, that is, what, a hundred sermons? But uh, th this is what I would like to just close with now. What does someone that loves God do? What do they do? Well, certainly they want to be with him. What else do you want to do with someone you love? You want to be like him. You want to be with him. I want to be like him. But I love 1 John 3 3. It says, Beloved. He's speaking, he's speaking to, to you. He's speaking to those in this letter. He was speaking to the people who were beloved by God. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. Wow. That's what happens. We want to be like him. We want to be like Jesus Christ. How do you become like Jesus Christ? It starts off like this. Lord Jesus, I, I, would you please show me how to be more like you? Lord, make me like you. Cry out. I cry out to you. That's how love is expressed. God doesn't like shallow. He, wants, he doesn't want your shallow. He wants your deep. And that's why he draws the cry out to you by going back and back and back. Back reject, back push away. You go back. He comes to you, push him away. Come, and finally you cry out. Yeah, let, make me more like you, Jesus Christ. If the worship team could come up at this time. I was just so blessed by the worship team today. So blessed. You've been asked to pray if you could please come up as well. If you've been asked to pray, please come up. You can stand up. We're going to worship with one last song. If you'd like to pray, there's, uh, wor uh, there's prayer folks that are, um, that are up, up here now. And you would like to pray with someone else. You'd just like to have someone pray for you. I want to love God with all my heart, my, my soul, my mind, and my strength. You'd like to have someone pray that for you. I'll be up here. We have other prayer couples here. Or if you'd like someone to pray, pray for you, show this man, show this woman how to be like Jesus Christ. Because again, what does someone who loves Jesus do? They want to be with him and they want to be like him. Sometimes becoming like him is it's frustrating. It's aggravating. It's like, well, how do you do this? What does someone do if they want to be like Jesus? I want to be like Jesus. What do I do? We'll pray for you at this time. So let me have a short, I'll, I'll give a short prayer, and then you can come up and pray, or you can stay in your seats and love God and worship Father, I just pray, thanking you in Jesus' name, thanking you. Lord, I can't get over it myself that you said you sent the prophets.
to the vineyard to get some fruit. You want my love. So often you do not get it. How I love it when I do, it gives me so much joy. How much more joy do I want than I have, Lord? Make me love you more. Fill us with the spirit that we can love you more, Lord. And help us worship now, in Jesus' name.